Welcome back. Today we are starting in Chapter 9, Motla College Theater Appreciation, as we talk about musical theater. Um, what is musical theater? Well, um, it's important to understand that theater has always had music in it. Like we talked about from the ancient Grecian times, we know there was a chorus. We're pretty sure that there was singing and dancing. Uh, Shakespeare, over half of his plays have songs written in or dances or both. Uh, Moliere, they would have like little musical interludes. So music is nothing new to the theater. Um, and it's definitely always been involved in plays, but musical theater as we think of it today is an American art form that's only been around for about 150 years, right? Um, uh, when, when we say musical theater, we mean a very distinct genre there. Um, when people come uh, from China or from um, you know, India, if you go to Times Square, you can see it. There are a lot of tourists there to see an American musical. Uh, that's our art form as Americans. Uh, now, when we say, when I say Times Square, I'm talking about Broadway. And that is, uh, if you've ever seen the ball drop um, on New Year's Eve, that's usually dropping on Times Square, which is sort of a hub in New York City. Um, it's a theater district. A lot of big cities have theater districts, and um, I've talked about that before. Uh, you know, a lot of old cities have a Chinatown, and they have a theater district, and so uh, it's not unusual. It just happens that, um, you know, the theater district district in Boston is not nearly as famous as the theater district in New York City. Uh, which goes from 42nd Street uh, or 41st all the way to 50th. Um, so in order for it to be a Broadway style show it needs to have over a thousand seats and remember that changes the dynamic between the audience and the people on stage. The people on stage have to have big old jazz hands right and uh, larger than life poses in order to bring that message all the way out to the um, auditorium you're sitting in where there are lots of people so there's going to be an entire chorus kick lines large dance numbers because um, they're trying to razzle dazzle you from a, a you know considerably less intimate theater than say Motlow main stage if you go down uh, to Motlow it's a very small theater so doing a big large um, Broadway style show may not feel right because it's an intimate space uh, you know, you don't want to stick your jazz hands in somebody's face. So, uh, here in Middle Tennessee, you may have gone to the Tennessee Performing Arts Center to see a Broadway-style show. If you went down to Alabama and Huntsville, we have the Von Braun Civic Center. Those are our two major hubs. Now, if you're going to New York City, the tickets are expensive, and I'm sure some of my business-oriented people are already doing the math. Yes, Broadway is definitely a money maker and a tourist attraction, as I already said. Uh, people, you know, I was late, waiting in line to see Cyrano de Bergerac or Once or any of those plays. I was hearing other languages spoken. So, um, it is the top-grossing American tourist activity. Um, it is specifically American in that it is a melting pot of different ideas. Um, so first I have here Jewish songwriters. These are really the backbone of musical theater. Remember, um, if you know anything about history, we had loose immigration at this time. And so um, at the turn of the century, we had an influx of Jewish immigrants uh, from oh, from Austria and Germany and Hungary. Um, and they were uh, have a strong educated music background and music is central to the Jewish faith and a lot of the chords and ways that you hear uh, those are all sorry about my Google back up there um, <laughs> I didn't mean for that to pop up uh, technology yay uh, you know if we look at a great songwriter like Irving Berlin maybe around Christmas time you've heard uh, White Christmas sisters sisters right uh, you've seen it on TV and um, you know the funny kind of thing about that and kind of funny sad is that Irving 
Berlin probably didn't celebrate Christmas, but he, as a minority culture, you know, white Hanukkah probably wouldn't have had the same <laughs> um, epic resonance that white Christmas does in a predominantly uh, Protestant country. So, uh, can't we we talk about when we'll talk about in the next section uh, tap dancing as an art form and how that was really central uh, the showy kind of tap dancing that relied heavily on Scottish and Irish uh, folk dancing uh, that clogging probably um, was practiced well we know it was practiced in vaudeville uh, but that probably came directly from uh, those Celtic countries uh, can't overstate the importance of jazz music, which came from African American heritage. Uh, we know that a lot of those great jazz musicians came from here in the South, down in Mississippi and uh, Memphis and those areas. They had a heavy effect. Uh, they talk about in the opening chapters here Gilbert and Sullivan. And if you've ever heard, oh, there's tons of uh, references to them on like Family Guy or The Simpsons. They speak, uh, they sing in a very fast patter kind of way. Let me give you an example. Uh, I am the very model of a modern major general, right? And they have this um, quick way of speaking that is kind of showy. And that made its way into American musicals, although it was definitely altered as a style. Most of them didn't sound as operatic as the operettas or light operas as the English called them. And then good old fashioned bar entertainments, right? Um, we had quite a big vaudeville circuit here in Tennessee. If you go to the uh, Nashville uh, airport, you can see the busts, uh, sculptures of different vaudeville performers and the uh, contributions that they had to country music. Uh, vaudeville happened in a kind of a bar type environment. People would boo, people would throw things uh, like old vegetables. Um, but those bar entertainments and somebody uh, sitting down to ragtime on a piano, uh, that definitely had a huge impact on what we now think of as the American Broadway musical style. So like I said, it's a melting pot. This is a picture from the um, musical Anything Goes, uh, which was a, a musical from pretty early on. I played, this is uh, at Motlow, uh, by the way, before I came here, but I uh, played Reno Sweeney at my high school, and I remember at the time trying to kind of like mine the depths of my character. I took myself very serious as a high school senior. <laughs> and uh, I was playing Reno Sweeney, who is a lounge singer. And there wasn't any depth in the play. There wasn't any deeper meaning in my character. <laughs> because in the age of musical comedy, the, the goal was to entertain. The goal was to make people laugh, to make people swoon with our romantic hijinks, uh, to make people feel patriotic, which I'm not saying that that's a superficial emotion. But he does rightfully call it kind of a jingoism, um, a pat patriotism that, that you know, is just no sense of criticism whatsoever, um, just kind of uh, light-hearted fun, right? Uh, and uh, <laughs> if you if you know the musical, uh, there's like a song, it's, you're the top, you're the coliseum, and the whole song is just listing ways that this person is the best. <laughs> and I think of that as kind of a perfect uh sort of insight into musical comedy in its early stages up until uh, the, the 1930s. It was very much a just, you know, lighthearted, fluff, fun, lots of physical gags. That's one of my favorite things about Anything Goes, lots of falling down, Three Stooges type fun. Um, so when did, if someone walks up to you on the street and asks you what was the first American musical, uh, the technical answer is Black Crook. That's what historians mar mark as the official time that all of this kind of started to mold together. And I'm sorry, I don't have a year there. Black Crook was in 1866, 1866, and we're on page 251, if you're following along. Um, and so a lot of what is going on, as I said last here, is sex appeal. You see that bottom one? Do you see those dancers are bare-legged? 
these French um, Parisian ballerinas were st stuck in New York City and uh, you know they took their tights off and people paid a lot of money to see it. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. It is considered the first official Broadway play. It was down in um, you know the the theater district. Uh, it had some melodrama it was uh, of course you can see the spiritual elements there um, fairy queen uh, down below I had Ziegfeld Follies they were kind of a, a, the beginning of Broadway this big producer Florence Ziegfeld uh, he had basically a skin show you can see that high cut there. A lot of the girls were wearing, um, you know, diamonds and lots of pretty girls standing in a line doing kicks, uh, but not necessarily uh, a lot of, more like a talent show. Honestly, when you think of theater in this time, think of a talent show. Because it wouldn't be unusual to grab a comic, to grab a jazz singer, to grab some pretty girls and, uh, you know, kind of string it together with a loose form um, plot. So, you know, somebody comes out, they sing their song, we had this sort of contrived plot to get us to the comedian, the comedian does their little uh, ragtime gag, and then we have this sort of contrived plot to get us to the jazz singer, and it, it was not necessarily about the story, and during the songs we didn't have any plot progression. It was mostly just basically a talent show. Um, archetypes. So I watched a documentary and I highly recommend it um, on PBS if you have a local library. Uh, I, I really do uh, recommend the Broadway documentary. It's in the library at Motlow as well if you'd like to check it out if you're a big uh, musical fan. Oh, and this is another Anything Goes picture from the production of Motlow. Uh, but they were talking about, yes, these women were cast in the leads, but they were almost always a new immigrant from Ireland, and she's wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, and this man, uh, you know, marries her and saves her, and it's a Cinderella story. And they had these sort of tropes that they relied on, and it wasn't necessarily um, deep. It wasn't... Uh, a lot of action really it was just more about kind of stringing together these entertainments and using these archetypical characters uh, you know so that we could uh, lightheartedly enjoy the show we didn't have to think too hard and as I said the song and dance you know we'd have if you look at White Christmas for example right <laughs> these sisters and they're traveling and they meet these guys but most of the dance numbers or in song numbers don't have anything to do really even with the story they were just um, entertainments within a loosely loosely uh, based plot and uh, you know they relied heavily on burlesque they relied heavily on um, a existing talent within other genres such as dance or music then showboat happen almost every theatrical historian will tell you and then showboat happen uh, this was produced by Laura, uh, Florence Ziegfeld who we talked about just a moment ago who was more into the skin flick and you know parading around identical pretty girls in a row um, but showboat was based on a novel about this showboat and the performances if you don't know uh, they would take these big boats and drive them uh, up the Mississippi and they would stop at every port and do the same play well um, the girl a little girl uh, our family is the owners of this showboat and the performers are um, you know kind of become part of the family as well so it's sort of the journey from uh, being a teenager all the way to her commercial success of this young girl but the opening moment of the play um, we have a woman a police officer coming on the boat and accusing this couple of um, mixed race uh, 
intermarrying between the races and I mean first moments of the show <laughs> this is really startling it's really uh, you know he- tackling some heavy issues that weren't being tackled in traditional musical theater uh, and uh, and then we have right after that we have the singing of Old Man River um, which if you've I'll probably put that as one of the clips that you have to watch because it's just such a moving song, I think. Um, and, and it was taking the African-American experience seriously. This was a nice, refreshing change from um, the Jim Crow. Remember, we said in the uh, other lecture, Jim Crow was not an actual person. He was a blackface character that a white man played, and they would make fun of African-Americans. Well, in Showboat, it was actually... Um, taking the plight of the African American, you know, seriously and their sadness, um, and so it, those are just, you know, the first opening moments are very racially charged, but towards the end, it ends up being more of kind of just a love story um, about a woman who falls in love with a man with gambling debt. But like I said, it's based on a novel, so there's some real storyline going on. There's progress of the plot. Uh, there's um, a deep and meaningful conversation going on between the audience and the play on stage. It wasn't just a simple pat answers. So here we come to the golden age of musicals. Uh, this was, um, you know, my grandmother loved musicals and as an extension, my mother loved musicals and we did. We loved all of these Oscar and Hammerstein um this is the sound of music, obviously. Of course, I grew up on the Julie Andrews, not the Carrie Underwood. Would, but I do think it speaks to their success that they're still being produced. And another thing that's sort of interesting is that Carrie Underwood uh, came to success uh, through American Idol. And a lot of the way that these Golden Age musicals worked was through radio, right? They would, you wonder why there are so many. Um, Actually, I'll wait for that. Why there are so many what we call gray hairs <laughs> coming into uh, the theater to see these old musicals. Well, they're listening to the music that they heard on the radio, the popular music of the time. Uh, so, um, granted, they probably heard Frank Sinatra singing it uh, rather than necessarily the star who sang it in the Broadway version. But, uh, you know, they it's more like a concert in some cases for them. Um touring companies started at this time so um, you could hear them all around the US of A it wasn't just a locally sourced commodity in New York City and as I said they were hits on the radio and that helped them to gain popularity everywhere in the United States and abroad these touring companies went to London these touring companies went to um, Amsterdam and they are still performed in all of those cities as well Oh, Hugh Jackman, you're such a handsome man. Um, he did Oklahoma at the in London, actually not in America. So Rodgers and Hammerstein is a sentimental format. Uh, it doesn't mean that they don't tackle big issues, as in Oklahoma. You know, there's a woman who's severely, uh, you know, uh, she has a man pursuing her, and she's scared that he's going to take advantage of her, right? That's a pretty heavy theme about the lack of uh, police enforcement or kind of the um, Old West, the way that they have to sort of self-regulate. There's not enough government structure at that time. And so a woman being afraid uh, for her virtue uh, because of a creepy guy, you know, those, they're not shying away from things. I mean, The Sound of Music has their Nazis. Um, but in general, it's still kind of in that American music melodrama theme. There are clear-cut good guys, you know, in Oklahoma, it's curly. Um, and then there's clear-cut bad guys as well. And so uh, it, we would tend to call that a sentimental. There's a lot of love songs. Uh, there's a lot of um, celebration of life moments that kind of make it a sentimental. And as I said, the song and dance scenes progress the plot. In Oklahoma, there's this famous ballet sequence, um, which... Uh, she kind of acts out this dream of how and that's when we really got to get to see how the main character feels about these two different men in her life uh, and that's very famous in that it kept the plot going even without words and it's a pretty long ballet sequence if you've ever watched um, Oklahoma 
<laughs> Once again, Rogers and Hammerstein are very Jewish. They probably never went to the American West. <laughs> this is a um, sort of a glazed over version, same way that the King and I, you know, they'd never been to um, anywhere in the uh, in Asia, but they're sort of want something more exotic to bring to the New York City stage. So uh, they're celebrating these cultures that are very different from the New York City culture. And that's pretty common in this era to try to uh, pull in some exoticism and kind of get a free vacation while you're also getting a musical experience. Okay, so West Side Story... uh, probably heard some of this music. It's very popular. I feel pretty. Oh, so pretty. Uh, Or this is my favorite song from it. An America. (laughs) Uh, It's a based on the story of Romeo and Juliet and um, in in that they're star-crest lovers in different gangs. Um, So Maria is Puerto Rican and Tony is Polish. Initially, um, these Jewish writers were thinking of stepping out and writing a story uh, between like interfaith, between a Catholic person and a Jewish person, but ultimately they decided um, that that was a little too close to home. So they, once again, and we'll talk about this in the next lecture, um, you know, the suppression of the minority. Uh, for them to even tell a story uh, about uh, Puerto Ricans uh, was, you know, sort of a, um, would have been an advancement to minority culture. Of course, they were done in what we would consider blackface. It's not blackface, but they would have painted themselves that color as opposed to probably hiring people of color. So um, it was it was once again kind of set in, um, it was set in New York City, and they were wearing the trendy clothes of the time. And I say like MTV, um, that it had a lot of buy-in because it was a very much uh, metropol, metropolitan. I don't know how I'm saying that. Metropolitan. There we go. <laughs> Find the word eventually. Uh, and metropolitan, and it was set in the current time. And these kids uh, were. You know, something that kind of gets poked fun at is the fight sequences. They're very dancey. These were um, highly choreographed. And then the knife fight, and if you've ever watched the movie, kind of looks like, um, you know, a a ballet rather than a knife fight. It's kind of a joke. Uh, The Sharks versus the Jets. But um, just a masterpiece. Really, when we talk about the artistry, West Side Story is one of the great musical theater experiences of the 20th century. Okay, well, moving on at a breakneck speed, um, we see that the golden age of musical was lighthearted. It was um, a little more serious than... Uh, than musical comedies. They weren't afraid to talk about Nazis or um, perverts. Um, But the contemporary musical really came along um, when rock and roll started being the the chart toppers. And and when this transition happened is very highly contested. Uh, Some people would want to say that it happened for longer than it did. uh, but the you know when it stopped being played on the radio and what was now being played on the radio was rock and roll. People instead of investing in tickets to the theater, they were investing in tickets to go see Elvis. So um, as a result, uh, Broadway suffered for sure. Another thing that happened in this time is that Broadway as a city was in a bad part of town in New York City. Uh, You know, the crime rate in the 60s and the 70s in New York City was very high. And before, um, before Disney came in and revitalized Broadway, and uh, Rudy Giuliani and his political, uh, some people would say abrasion and and, uh, political harshness, you know, he cleaned up New York City uh, in his own special way. Uh, But that did, in a lot of ways, really benefit the Broadway because Broadway was very dirty and there were strip clubs and you really didn't take your children into that part of town. Um, And so that um, 
heard it. And and even when tourists were coming, they were mo- mostly seeing revivals. We were still seeing re- Oscars and Hammerstein kind of productions rather than doing a lot of new ones. And still to this day, if you I watched the Tony Awards a few weeks ago as I'm recording this, and there were lots and lots of revivals because um, a big part of American Broadway is still those people supporting it who used to listen to it on the radio. And so celebrating that past well another thing somebody like me who grew up watching the golden age musicals when I go to New York City I want to see Oscar and Hammerstein Cinderella because I grew up listening to it you know and so there's a bit of nostalgia that's going on there um all right Chicago all that jazz uh we're talking about the choreographer director so what's happening is that theaters used to be able to afford all of this staff (laughs) Um, and part of kind of the downsizing of theater was the combination of the job the choreographer and the director and another thing that happened is we started uh, what can you see if you're going to Broadway well if you want to hear good music then you go to the concert well there's this rise in dance on Broadway because um, you know when you go to a concert presumably you don't always see good dancing but a lot of people don't necessarily enjoy the ballet so let's focus on dance that's something that Broadway has that a commercial concert usually doesn't have and so we have a lot of great choreographers coming out of this time and probably the greatest in my opinion is Bob Fosse he uh, did the choreography if you've ever seen the movie Chicago the movie Cabaret uh, Pippin all of these on your on the cover of your book here we have a Pippin in there and uh, oh no it's God's spell not Pippin I'm sorry I get those two confused but the the rise of intricate choreography not that there wasn't kick lines and traditional tap dancing before but uh, Bob Fosse had his own specific kind of choreography um, the plot of Chicago is about a woman who kills uh, you can see the guns in their hands there it's about a woman who kills a man that she was having an affair with and how that makes her popular and famous with the Chicago newspapers as opposed to um, her having any real moral consequences for her actions so it's a critique of fame and it's a little bit twisted which is pretty um, common in this era of of that sort of cynicism that was going on uh, I put the singles lady video there because Beyonce was inspired to watch uh, to create the singles lady video after she watched a YouTube video of Bob Fosse's wife doing a um, performance on the Ed Sullivan show and it was just three girls obviously well women Bob Fosse's wife was the main dancer and you know they did one take start to finish and Beyonce was so impressed by that because you know nowadays so many uh, music videos are just clippings of all together and Beyonce was sort of drawn to that um, impressive one take just doing the dance and so when she taped the singles lady video she made sure she got it in one take and it was really impressive and a lot of the ways that they're moving their hips in that video uh, that's very Fosse-esque so at the same time another big dance uh, musical going on is the chorus line it's also kind of reflects on the changing the the content of the play reflects on the changing nature of the theater so before I had my star who could sing and they got to stand in front and then I had my chorus line of dancers who would just come in and dance and leave and they often didn't even have lines in the play well what happened with the change in the decline of the theater is now we have to have a triple threat we talked about that in acting we have to have someone who can dance we have to have someone who can also sing and act they have to have all three of those skills so what a chorus line does is it takes dancers and it starts to ask them about themselves personally and trying to create a play based on these dancers actual lives so it's documentary kind of style um and so it's about the changing nature of broadway and uh, theater in general 
these guys are standing on a line and they're singing God I hope I get it I hope I get it and they're all trying to be part of the show they lift up their headshots and they show them their best dance numbers and they're seeking approval um, it's about the competitiveness of the business as well it's very meta theater like we talked about last class um, and then at the end uh, there's this very famous one singular sensation every single step she takes right uh, and they've got their hats and their matching costumes and they're all moving in unison which is the way that a chorus typically does and it's sort of a statement on Broadway because so often you know up into that time the dancers were so anonymous they were meant to look the same uh, if you went to go see the Rockettes perform these tap dancers uh, they have identical measurements they're all the identical height and if they uh, gain a pound lose a pound uh, <laughs> you know they're kicked out because they wanted these Barbie dolls to all be uh, uniform and not to distract away from the uh, the aesthetic as a whole rather than seeing each of these as individual people so um, it's kind of funny what the audience wants the whole time is that big Broadway feel but then when they finally get it at the end of the show and when they're singing that singular sensation song it's sort of dehumanizing and they see you know they see that as an audience so it's interesting it's thoughtful which is very typical of the 70s as well into the woods Stephen Sondheim who is by far um, my favorite and my mom's least favorite uh, because once again my mom likes uh, this golden age musical Oscar and Hammerstein she grew up doing that kind of thing and Stephen Sondheim is much more in the vein of what we just talked about in the last lecture this sort of disappointment with life and depth and another reason that she doesn't like Stephen Sondheim as much is because she really likes dance and um, Stephen Sondheim typically there's not as much dance disturbing plots you know into the woods the first half ends with these fairy tale endings Cinderella marries her prince and um, you know we have all of this happiness going on and then the second half of the play <laughs> is this plague with tons of people dying you know at the first half of the play Jack and the Beanstalk comes down and he's got his golden egg and you know he's got his money and then at the end uh, you know he's lost his mother he's lost his home so it, it, it kind of twists it's disturbing in its nature it's kind of funny because I went to go see a musical uh, a I went to go see Into the Woods at a private school in Nashville and they had only done the first half of the show. <laughs> Yay! It's pretty. It's everybody's happy. <laughs> uh, and so it, it, I, I wonder how Sondheim feels about his plays being, you know, Disneyized in some ways. So intricate music you don't not that Sondheim is necessarily hard to sing but it's definitely hard to play on the piano so if if you're auditioning you're not really supposed to use Sondheim because staying with the music and part of that goes back to Gilbert and Sullivan who we talked about before and the patter Sondheim usually includes things like um, well there's this song in company pardon me is everybody there because if anybody's there I'd like to thank you all for coming to the wedding I'd appreciate your going even more I think it is so it's just really fast and that's part of uh, his way of doing things sometimes uh, he has all kinds of themes that he embraces you know Sweeney Todd is about a barber from uh, Fleet Street demon barber and he he slits people's throats and cooks them up in pies and uh, unknowingly serves them to his customers <laughs> uh, so that's you know that's pretty dark but that uh, is set in different time frames there's modern you know something like company is set in modern urban life so um, Sondheim embraces all kinds of um, environments when, in his plays. Um, Stephen Sondheim is also a homosexual and uh, Jewish uh, by descent, and uh, there's been some, you know, he's he's reserved. He doesn't necessarily share all of his story, uh, but he Into the Woods you can see is written right there in the 80s during the time of. Uh, AIDS was hitting New York really hard so if we look at Into the Woods and the second half of the play is about death it really is there's all these people dying unexpectedly 
And so how much was that a reaction to Stephen Sondheim's own experience uh, in the AIDS crisis in the late 80s in New York City? Uh, I didn't touch on Rent, uh, but it's also a very important musical about talking about AIDS um, in New York City uh, at this time because it hit Broadway very hard. Uh, okay, Les Mis. Uh, this was a musical that my mom tried to take me to in sixth grade. <laughs> and uh, I was bored to death because it is, it's very gritty and real and um, intense. And, you know, I had seen cats and I loved cats. I got that. You know, they were dancing cats. So it's not to love for a fifth grade girl. Uh, but Les Miserables was, you know, the title of the play is The Miserable. <laughs> Oh. Um, so it's an import. Uh, th- during this time, like I said, Broadway was really suffering. It was a rundown area. We have the AIDS crisis. We have um, not as many people wanting to pay money to see Broadway plays. They'd rather pay for concerts. And so London starts to, you know, producing their plays in the West End and then picking up the entire production, the uh, cast members, a lot of the technical staff, they would get on a plane and then come to New York City and perform these what we call British import shows. Um, the original story is based on a Hugo novel, uh, you probably have heard of Victor Hugo before. He's a very famous uh, novelist, a contemporary of Charles Dickens. And he writes in this romanticism. And remember we talked about romanticism having extremes, having grit, having, uh, you know, Dracula and Frankenstein were both part of the romantic movement. And so it is melodramatic. A lot of people who went to go see this movie um, that were friends of mine were just like, oh, I just I had a hard time watching it. You could see their teeth and it was sweat and grit. Well, really, the director was um, staying true to the genre in that way uh, because it's, it's not meant to be a pretty story. It's meant to be about this horrible French Revolution, all of the death that was involved in it. So what happened with these import shows was always a large spectacle. If you went to go see an Andrew Lloyd Webber play, uh, such as Phantom of the Opera, you're there partially to applaud the actors, but also to applaud this huge chandelier that falls, right? And it's a big spectacle. It's it's epic. It's large. Uh, you know, if you're going to see Cats, you're going to see all this... Um, larger than life cat uh, uh, choreography if you're going to see Miss Saigon there's a helicopter that lands on stage at the end of the play Andrew Lloyd Webber always has these larger than life stories at least his ones that were written in the 80s and not necessarily uh, Jesus Christ Superstar but um, in Les Mis they had this turntable can you hear and we, I think we talked about that when we talked about um technical theater uh, so that they could march in place since that was a huge theme of this military um, resistance so if you see an 80s musical it's probably going to be um, melodramatic the phantom of the opera is here right it's it's going to have um, a lot of melodrama a lot of larger than life themes it's going to have a rock opera sensibility kind of like you too because um, that was what was popular in the music of the time all right, moving on to a more modern theater. This is a musical that I saw at TPAC as I'm recording this. I saw it last uh, fall. It's from the creators of South Park, so it is offensive <laughs> and uh, very funny, very, very funny. Um, it's also written by Robert Lopez. Uh, you may have remembered him from um, Avenue Q, which was a spoof on Sesame Street with puppets is very funny uh, but he also wrote Frozen the music for Frozen uh, let it go let it go right and Kristen Anderson Lopez is his wife she's a co-writer with him and if you have ever actually heard the music to Frozen their daughter uh, sings on the um, on the soundtrack she's the do you want to build a snowman and that's her it's so cute that his family and that he writes for his family I think so sweet um and Robert Lopez, and it's no, it's no coincidence, this relationship between Disney and Broadway. If we look at Beauty and the Beast, which was the first play that was produced on Broadway, um, you know, it was written 
with with Tim Rice, you know, these these Broadway composers, the ones who are staging and writing this play, um, and that then gets turned into an animated uh, experience. It, it's very much, you know, when you watch Aladdin, you can see the dance moves, or <laughs> they're doing box steps and jazz hands. It's it is very much the Broadway formula turned to the stage. And when um, Disney decided to start producing their plays in New York City and Julie, Rudy Giuliani cleared it out for them and um, you know it was a very simple step to put a play like Little Mermaid on uh, Broadway because it was already very formulaically a musical, a Broadway musical. So um, you know for Robert Lopez to step over and do Frozen it's not a huge stretch because um, most of those successful Disney movies are in the style of Broadway. When I went to see Book of Mormon, there were missionaries from the Mormon church in the lobby. <laughs> I thought that was pretty brave of them to be made fun of on stage and then to be out in the lobby. And I really thought it was admirable, the Book of uh, the Church of uh, Latter-day Saints that, you know, they're making fun of. The uh, released a statement saying, you know, we we think this is all in good fun it's a satire satire is always meant to make us better and so they were very good sports about it uh even me i'm i'm not easily offended but uh, i was offended by moments of that play south park always has a way of kind of stepping over the line <laughs> um but uh definitely speaks to the modern medium which is often a mix of television um you know it's, i showed you a picture of hairspray a minute ago you know that was first a movie then it's a musical then it's remade into a movie uh if you go down to Broadway right now, you'll see a lot of um, musicals that are also movies because people just don't want to necessarily take a risk. So when you're thinking for your discussion question about what musical you want to see, uh, you may see Broadway actors who are also film actors. You may see um, Broadway musicals that are also, also movies because there's a lot of crossover between film and TV and Broadway nowadays. Uh, in some ways, it's a way for you to see your favorite film actor in person. Uh, that's definitely a big appeal on Broadway right now. All right, so <laughs> there's a clip in the, the documentary clip that I gave you of Hair, and so I wanted to touch on it. It's really an important musical, but he didn't put it in this chapter, which I thought was weird. Uh, but if you turn over into chapter 10, it's the first page there. Sorry, I'm catching up with you. Um, uh, Hair was a rock musical that was kind of like a concert on stage. This is a version that I was in. I'm that blob in the bottom left hand course. We're singing Let the Sunshine In. Um, it was anti-war. It was part of the peace movement. And it was really shocking. A lot of the things that we talked about last class, uh, the absurdity, the in-your-face, you know, of Ubi Roy. Um, there's nudity on stage during hair. There's uh, people actually smoking pot in the theater uh, on stage. Uh, there's a scene where they take LSD in... Um, it's rumored that in the original Broadway, they actually would take LSD on stage at that moment. Uh, there's, you know, sexuality in that, you know, uh, there's a black woman saying white boys are pretty. And then there's also a song about fellatio. I mean, it's really shocking. And so there's a lot of similarities between uh, the Book of Mormon and Hair, oddly enough. Uh, but beautiful choreography, uh, very much a celebration of a counterculture movement, and in some ways was trying to embrace the current culture rather than continue on with these um, museum pieces, these restored, you know, anything goes is always going to run on Broadway or, or shows like it because there are people who want to see that. But there are still a lot of breaking edge things that are going on um, that may be uh, are less ce celebrated or only celebrated by a niche market of people like myself who really enjoy um, really enjoy musical theater but I believe that is all for me today uh, if you will watch those clips and take the quiz 
Uh, I know that some of you are not a big fan of musical theater. I do understand that it's a niche market, and I try to only talk about it in this chapter so that we can, uh, you know, only expose you to a limited <laughs> uh, amount of jazz hands in case your cheese factor is overwhelming. And remember, when you go to see your play, if you don't like musicals, you don't have to see a musical. You can always go see um, a different play that interests you more. So, as always, thank you for listening.